Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God, our Father, and our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen. You woke up, it's a regular day, and you look down, and the skin on your arm, there's a white spot. It seems small and inconspicuous, and you just sort of ignore it and go about your day, you go to work and make food for your family and go about your normal routine. But the next morning when you wake up, it's a little bit bigger and it's starting to itch and you're a bit concerned. And so you go to see the physician in your town and the priest. And tragedy upon tragedy strikes. You receive the worst possible thing. Nobody wants to hear it. You have leprosy. As you reel from this news... You're threatened to be overwhelmed by the implications of what this means. Not only is this an uncurable disease with an inevitable sentence of death, but now I must be ostracized from public life. I cannot live with my family anymore. I cannot touch other people. I have to leave town and never come back. And as it threatens to overwhelm you, it's all you can do to put one foot in front of the other. Can you imagine receiving such terrible news? And unfortunately, there are diseases, fortunately not this one, very often, nowadays where a similar diagnosis breeds a similar response. But the social ramifications of leprosy were quite severe. So severe, as I told the children, that whenever they were now approached by anyone who didn't have leprosy, they were to shout, unclean, unclean, stay away. In other words, they couldn't be around people anymore. Can you imagine that? We got a little dose of that in the last year and a half, being isolated, and it turns out human beings aren't meant for that. I remember at the beginning of the pandemic, there was a lot of talk about church going fully digital, and that was the way of the future. But by the time the end of 2020 came about, nobody was talking about that anymore. Because we all knew intrinsically there's something about our created being that is not meant to be alone. So this is a terrible, terrible diagnosis. One of the worst, if not the worst, you could be told in the ancient world. But imagine now that you're one of these ten lepers from our story and now you've heard that there's this guy going around and wherever he goes, people who haven't been able to speak their entire life can now talk. People who haven't been able to see or hear can now see and hear freely. People who've been paralyzed and unable to walk, he simply says, rise, take up your mat, and walk, and they do. And imagine now that you hear that this man, Jesus, who's doing all these unbelievably amazing things, is on his way to your town. He's on his way near your colony of lepers, Can you imagine the excitement that you would feel? Because at this point, you're at the end of your rope. You think there's no hope for you. And yet, Jesus shows up and does things that everyone thinks are impossible. Heals things that are unhealable. And you find yourself desperately hoping that you can get his attention. And how does our story begin in Luke 17, the account begins with this great cry of mercy, which is even more interesting when we know that the legal ramifications are that you are supposed to raise your voice and shout, but you're supposed to shout that you're unclean and that the person should stay away. But instead, what do these men shout? They say, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. What is Jesus' response to this cry, this cry of desperation? This may be their last hope. Does he turn them in because they broke the law? Does he run away from them in fear because he doesn't want to get the disease that is afflicting them? Does he berate them? No. 
Jesus' response to this cry of mercy. And we're given to believe that they did it in faith, a certain degree of faith, because they don't call him just Jesus. They'd say, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. Jesus' response is to just simply declare from his word, go and show yourselves to the priests. Now, many of you may be wondering what the heck that means. That's kind of a strange response to a cry for mercy. Go and show yourselves to the priests. Well, the priests were the only people in society that could deem them as no longer unclean and able to return to society. And so Jesus tells them, go and show yourselves to the priests. And they believed him because they went. And as they were going, they were cleansed of their leprosy. What an unbelievable miracle. Can you imagine their joy and their elation for all the things that this means now? Formerly they thought they were doomed to die alone among other lepers, away from the people they've known, never able to maybe hold their children again, hug their spouse, go to family gatherings, be with their friends, and now all of a sudden, because of the words of Jesus, this is back on the table. So I'll ask you the same question I asked the kids. Is that a tiny gift that you sort of have, eh, you know, cool? Or is that an amazing gift that should prompt unbelievable thankfulness and thanksgiving? Well, let's hop out of the story for a moment. You are a leper. So am I. I don't mean, obviously, literally, that you have leprosy or me. But we have also received a troubling diagnosis, similar in ramification, even actually worse in ramifications than the diagnosis of leprosy. It started out with a small lie, started out with a little deception, a small streak of stubborn disobedience. No big deal, right? But when we approach the great physician, the diagnosis rings out. You are sinful and unclean. And the ramifications of such a disease, of such an affliction, are death. And not just the death of this life, but an eternal death, an eternal separation from God, and a hopeless cutting off from his kingdom. You see, you and I, we've made ourselves enemies of God. This is why when Peter in the boat realizes who Jesus really is, his first response is, depart from me, for I am a sinful man. So like the lepers, what hope do we have? Well, we heard about a guy named Jesus who has something to say and something to do for people like us in hopeless and incurable situations. And we, like the lepers, cry out in a loud voice for mercy. In fact, you did that this morning already. That's what we do. That's why we start our service with the confession and the absolution, is that we lay ourselves down at the feet of God, imploring his mercy to rescue us from our incurable state. And just like for them, he doesn't run away from us. He doesn't condemn us as he rightly could according to the law of God. But he responds by speaking his word of mercy. And he doesn't need to send us to the priest because priests and pastors can't do anything about sin. They have it themselves. He points to himself and what he has done on the cross. And you hear those gracious, loving, and glorious words, your sins are forgiven, not by anything you've done, but by what Jesus has done. So the leper, you may have more in common with the lepers in the story than you initially thought. All right, let's hop back into the text. So now all of them have been healed, right? They're on their way to the priests, and they've all noticed that they've been cleansed of this disease. If you want to see what leprosy looks like, maybe with caution, look up some pictures. I mean, it's pretty easy to tell that you no longer have it. So do you think that they were all thankful, that they were no longer 
afflicted with this terrible illness. Of course they were. Yet, the text goes on and informs us that only one person turns around to give thanks. And really there's this distinction, and you'll notice that in both the Old Testament reading and in the reading from Thessalonians, the wording is quite specific, that Christians are meant to give thanks. We're not meant to merely be thankful, but to give thanks. So one of them returns, and in a loud voice the text tells us he praises God and he falls on his feet before Jesus offering him thanksgiving and praise, which also you have done this morning. Next song we sing, pay attention to the words. Almost all the songs we sing are a prayer of praise to God for what he has done for us. This is us falling on our faces before him, giving him praise and thanksgiving for the wondrous work that he has done. That's how the service is set up. It's set up that the highlights of the service are how God is serving us through the gift of his word and the gift of his sacraments. And then we return thanksgiving in songs of praise and prayers uplifted to him. But you might be tempted to think when you read this text, what is the difference? Who really cares? Because they're all healed, right? It's not like Jesus then says, oh, okay, those guys didn't come back. Boom, they've got leprosy again. They all were healed. Jesus kept the healing. So what, what difference does it make to return and give thanks to God? Well, the text gives us two really key interactions here that only this Samaritan who returns to give thanks to God experiences. The first one is he's actually the only person in the story who praises God. The others don't praise God. They're thankful for what God did for them, but they don't really maybe even know who Jesus truly is. And so the Samaritan is the only one who praises God. He's the only one who worships him. And Jesus acknowledges his worship. Notice that it doesn't say that he praises Jesus, but he praises God. And Jesus does not turn him away for that. Another story that illustrates the significance of that is the story from the Old Testament, 2 Kings chapter 5, the healing of another leper named Naaman. And he goes to the prophet of God, Elisha, and Elisha tells him to wash in the Jordan River, and he'll be healed. So Naaman follows the instructions, and he's healed. Now, there's more to the story than that, but that's the gist of it. And at the end of this, he wants to give Elisha a great reward, a thanksgiving for what he has done, and Elijah refuses to take the gift, insisting that he is not the one who has done the healing. But God has, so offer these gifts to him. But in this story, the one who's done the healing is there. And the Samaritan praises God, and Jesus doesn't say, why are you praising me? He says, why have only one come to praise God? So the first thing is that the Samaritan is the only one who actually praises Jesus as God. The second is that only the Samaritan receives a recognition of his faith. After he gives thanksgiving and Jesus asks his questions, he says to the Samaritan, Rise and go your way. Your faith has made you well. Now clearly he's not talking about the leprosy here because that's already been made well. He's talking about something else. The disease that we all shared, the affliction that we all share in sin. Rise and go your way, your faith has made you well. So you might be wondering, because last week I said we're going to have a four-week series on stewardship. And you might be wondering what the heck this has to do with stewardship. I haven't talked about anything related to money or serving in the church, etc. Well, it helps us see... That a faithful steward is called to be more than just thankful, but is called to give thanks, to give thanks to God. And don't, don't misunderstand, giving thanks to God is not something we do in order to be saved, but it is something we are now called to do because we are saved. Notice that the Samaritan does not return of his own volition to Jesus randomly. He doesn't just see Jesus and praise him as God. It says very specifically in the text that he saw that he was cleansed and he returned. 
Right? He noticed that Jesus had freed him from this incurable affliction, and he returned to give him thanks and praise. And so we are called to return to God and give our thanks and praise for this salvation from our affliction of sin and death. And the Samaritan is a good example for us in stewardship as well. Because a lot of things can be applied to the image of returning to God and falling on our face in thanksgiving. Because we have even more reason to be thankful to God than the other nine who received this healing of leprosy. As terrible as that disease is, God has done a far greater miracle of healing in you and me. And this is part of the life of faith we now live. It's why many of you are here this morning. Not to check off some box on the the good Christian to-do list, but because this is an interaction with God that we desperately need. A reminder of the healing, a continual support and supply of encouragement from God's word and supplication of our faith in the promise of salvation in Jesus. This is the cycle of our worship, the back and forth between God and us of him doing an amazing, unbelievable thing, and we return to him praise and thanksgiving. And it's reflected in the cycle of our everyday life as well. As we learned last week, every good and perfect gift comes from God. And so we are called to be constantly giving thanks for the myriad of blessings he showers upon us. So you and I, we were previously terminally desperate people. Without Jesus, this is why Paul says that without Christ and the resurrection, we are people most to be pitied. Because if that's not true, then we're left in this desperate situation and no one can save us from us. But God comes into our world in Jesus and speaks his word, a word that creates what it says. And he says to us, you are forgiven. So really, we should be falling on our faces all the time in thanksgiving and praise to God. What does that look like, practically speaking? Because obviously I'm not saying that you should have your face on the ground everywhere you go. It looks like confession and absolution, which we shared this morning and we'll share again next week and every week to come until Christ returns. It looks like a returning of a portion of what he has given to us. It looks like taking the time to turn and be at his feet to hear and study his word. It looks like serving and obeying his commands. So take a look at your skin and see that you're healed. Let God's word encourage you as as a redeemed and healed sinner with new life to give thanks to God in your words, with the abilities and talents he has blessed you with here in the congregation and out in the community, and with the earthly wealth that he has entrusted to you. So you have gathered here this morning at the beginning of a new day and a new week. You are face down at the feet of Jesus. That's why we are here giving thanks to God. You saw the healing and have come to give thanks. Therefore, hear him when he says to you, my fellow stewards, rise and go your way. Your faith has made you well. In the name of Jesus, amen. May the peace of God, which passes all human understanding, guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus until he comes again to make all things new. Amen.